Welcome to Wesley United Methodist Church on this Pentecost Sunday, the day where we celebrate the birth of the church. I'd like to begin with a prayer. Let us pray. Wise and gracious God, how intimately you know the creation that your hand is fashioning, that breathes the wind of your spirit. Though you have an infinite capacity to preserve, you have so designed creation that resurrection, not preservation, is the aim of all life. You have set the seasons turning in their cycle. You have set the earth spinning, circling the sun like an immortal lover. All is change. All is motion. This is your will, that even in the endless red heat of the Sahara, the sands will creep before the wind. And even over the endless blue ice of the Arctic, the sun will sink before the stars. Since the beginning, evening has followed morning, and you have declared the day good. This is the way of this world, for in the soil of your hand, eternity is a flower, and in the ocean of your eye, immortality is the tide. This you know, but we desire not change, but permanence. Not motion, but repose. Not evening and morning, but eternal noon. We would use our freedom to protect what we have at this moment and to perpetuate who we are at this time. Wise and gracious God, you create us in your image, but we hide it well. Your messenger, Jesus Christ, Work to awaken us to the holy temple within us, where the chains and motion of death and resurrection receive your blessing. He died and arose at it as its crowning expression, but predictably, when he had risen, we had difficulty re recognizing him because he was no longer the same. We would not believe because he was different. When he was dead, we had wanted him back. We had longed for the good old days. But his return brought a new day, and he was not back to stay. We begged him not to go, but he replied that it was to our advantage that he leave. If he did not, the Spirit would not come. He knew that if he remained we would use him. He had walked his road. We would bronze his steps. He had preached the gospel. We would engrave it in stone. He had carried his cross. We would adore it as a relic. He had conquered the grave. We would kneel at the tomb. Jesus knew that if he remained, he would forever be merely the focus of our wonder and the object of our worship. Our excuse for looking to a past already gone instead of a future yet to come. We would preserve him instead of serving him. Eternal noon would be confined to Sunday morning. We would commit him to the tomb once again and thereby banish our lives to the same fate. O oh Lord, your messenger knew this. And so, despite our protests, he left us, that we might dwell in your spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and awe, the spirit that moved over the face of the waters in the beginning of time. O oh God, in our hands you have placed the seeds of the eternal flower. In the power of your spirit, let us not hold them forever, but risk their planting. In our eyes you have placed droplets of the immortal tide. In the power of your spirit, let us not keep them forever, but risk their running. For through the planting of the seed shall your kingdom come. 
We pray in the name of our Savior Christ. Amen. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Serene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own language, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, they are filled with new wine. But Peter, but Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, 
blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for the spirit that you left to be with us. May it inhabit our hearts as we hear your words. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Few birthdays are celebrated without some memory of what it took to bring that life into the world. Today we celebrate Pentecost, which is often referred to as the birthday of the church. You know the story. The believers were all gathered in one place, around 120 of them, where they had been waiting and praying for the promised power from on, from on high. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a mighty wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And something like flames appeared over their heads, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability. So that when they poured out of the house, like college students leaving a party at 2 a.m., in the morning, making far too much noise. Those foreigners who were in Jerusalem, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, all heard them, each in his own language, proclaiming the mighty acts of God. We tell this story every year on the church's birthday. But I wonder, is there somewhere, someone somewhere with a half smile on his or her lips remembering what it took to give birth to the church? And who would that be exactly? Who gave birth to the church? I was on a Zoom call the other day and speaking to some minister friends of mine. And I asked, well, who gave birth to the church anyway? One said, the Holy Spirit. But I said, was it? I mean, I know the Holy Spirit was present on the church's birthday, but did the Spirit give birth to the church? And that made me think twice. three times. I thought about God the Father, the maker of heaven and earth, the one who scooped up clay from the river bank to make the first human being. Was it the Father that, who brought the church into being? It'd be odd to think of God carrying the church around in his womb, but it isn't hard to imagine God carrying the idea of the church around in his heart and not only for nine months, but for years and years and years before the church came into being. Maybe from the very beginning he had this dream that one day whosoever believed in him could be part of his family. I thought about God the Son, sent by a father who loved the world and wanted to save it. Jesus called those first disciples and trained them for the work of the kingdom. He preached good news to the poor, opened the eyes of the blind, and set at liberty all those who were oppressed. In the end, for all his efforts, he was nailed to a cross where he suffered and moaned, struggled and groaned. He labored to bring the church into being. In a very literal sense, it was the death of him. Now, while many mothers have done as much for their children, no one has ever done more. 
And then I thought about God, the Holy Spirit, roaring into that room on the day of Pentecost like a tornado, filling those dumbstruck believers with power from on high that loosened their tongues and left tongues of fire dancing over their heads. It was an unforgettable moment, one we've been talking about ever since. But was it the Spirit that gave birth to the church? Or was the Spirit only the first breath of life the newborn church sucked into its lungs? It's hard to say. But either way, the church would not have come into existence without the Spirit. And even now, without it, the church can't exist. And so the answer to the question, who gave birth to the church, is God the Father, Son, and Spirit, who conceived, nurtured, labored, delivered, and gave the breath of life to that infant body of Christian believers. But to answer that question is to raise another very important question maybe the most important question. Why? Why did God give birth to the church? You know, ever since my children were old enough to hear it, Christine, my wife, and I have told them the story of how they were born. We try to spare them the clinical details. And we don't talk much about the pain or labor. But we try to tell our children how much we looked forward to their arrival, how exciting it was when it finally came, and how happy we were to look on their sweet faces and hold them in our arms. We want them to know that none of this happened by accident, that even before they arrived, we were busy making a place for them in our home and in our hearts painting the nursery, reading the What to Expect When You're Expecting book, dreaming big dreams and having high hopes for them. I think that among other things, we want them to understand that their lives matter and that they're here for a reason. I hear that sometimes from people who have escaped some near brush with death. God must have spared me for a reason. And I say, yes. And your job is to figure out what that reason is. But I can go one better than that. I don't not only think God kept you in this world for a reason, I think God brought you into this world for a reason. And that it's not only those of us who have had a brush with death who need to figure out what it is, but all of us who've been given the gift of life. I think it's the same is true for the church. I think God brought the church into being for a reason. And I don't think the reason was so that we would have a comfortable place to gather on Sunday mornings to sing hymns and hear sermons. I think God gave birth to the church because the world needs the church. And I not only think that the world needs the church, I think the world needs this church. And if that's true, we can stop sitting around trying to figure out why we're here and get busy figuring out how to meet that need. You know, I think the United Methodist Annual Conference gets it wrong with pastors starting on or around July 1st. Pastors really should begin their ministry on the day of Pentecost for several reasons. But one of them is that the day marks the birthday of the church. It's the day the church came to life, but it's also the day the church went to work. 
By the end of that first Pentecost, Scripture tells us 3,000 people had been added to the number of believers. 3,000 people. I'd like to think that everyone who can hear my voice right now could seize this day as the perfect opportunity to begin something new. I want to encourage you by saying that I think God brought you into this world for a reason. And I don't think that that reason was to sit on a pew. God wants you to be fully involved in a church that is working to change the world. And I hope this church seems like that kind of church to you. Because if you check out social media or watch any kind of news, you'll see that things really need to change in our world. And if you're already involved in the church, maybe this is the day you'll draw a deep breath of fresh commitment. Inhale the Holy Spirit and promise God, and promise God that He has not labored in vain, that the church He brought into the world, because the world needs it, is alive and well and ready to get to work that we're willing to say, I'm ready for anything, especially in these uncertain times where our lives have been turned upside down and all the way around. God, I'm ready for anything. Whether you're watching this service on television or on our webpage, this day can be a perfect opportunity for you to begin something new. In this pandemic, there's been a, a lot of talk of what really, constitute, what really constitutes the church. Is it a building, a community, an individual? And the answer is yes. It's all those things but sometimes not all those things at the same time. So here we are, meeting through the web, social media, Zoom, continuing to be the church. But we say things, well, but it's not the same. True. But that misses the point entirely. Being the church has nothing to do with things being the same. Never has. Listen. Listen. Those believers who were gathered on the day of Pentecost didn't have any idea of what was about to happen that day. They didn't know what God was going to do. But they had been waiting and praying for God to have his way with them. And on that day he did. And things would never be the same again. For them or for us. This day, today could be that day for you. You know, if we've learned anything through this pandemic ordeal, it should be how little we control on our blue and green sphere we call the earth. So on this Pentecost, this day of new beginnings, this Pentecost Sunday, the opportunity to respond to what God is doing in your life and my life may be the most important thing of all. No matter where you are located, no matter what our circumstances are, I encourage us to let go of the grip we have or want to have 
on our lives. And let God have his way with us. Let's open ourselves for real to God's spirit. God brought us into the world for a reason. God brought us into this world for a reason. And today, today, just might be the day when we find out what it is. Are you ready? Are you ready? And all of God's children said, Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, help us to open our hearts and minds for your spirit. Help us to be the church in this place and in all places. Help us to be ready for anything, knowing that where we go, you are there. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.